Awesome, awesome. All right, well, we are in a series called Do It Again. And if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go to YouTube. You can tune in and you can watch part one of Do It Again. We're going to read a verse together um, in just a second. But before we do, I like to start with a little humor. And yesterday we had an event called Unshakable here at the church. And we had just a ton of men here. Had an incredible time. It was an awesome, awesome time. And uh, I shared with them a few memes. And so I'm going to tell you the top meme of Unshakable. And you know, if uh, you're a little frustrated because this is bathroom humor, it was a men's conference. Come on. So so here we go. Let me just show you this. Um, I named my toilet Jim instead of John. Everyone is so impressed when I tell them I go to the gym every morning. Hey, man, come on. <laughs> so, all right. Hey, stand to your feet. We're going to get started today. I want to invite you wherever you are to stand. We're going to read a passage of Scripture and honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to hear the words of David. And this is what David told King Saul. He wanted to go fight Goliath, this giant that was coming against God's people. And as he was telling Saul the reason why Saul should let him go to battle against the enemy, here's what he said. Can you all say it with me? Let's read it together. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. You see, he had already seen victories over the bear and over the lion. And here's what he said. Hey, if God did it before, he can do it again. And I feel like, like this weekend that, and really this series, what God is stirring in our hearts is to be reminded that, listen, God is the same. We learned last week, yesterday, today, and forever. And how many have seen God do miraculous things in the past? Listen, no matter what your challenge that you're walking through right now, if he did it before, he can do it again. So I want you to close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, I'm going to invite Pastor Anthony to come up and pray over the sermon. Would you do that, Pastor Anthony? There's a mic right here, the green mic. And uh, he's going to lead us out in a prayer right now, asking the Holy Spirit to come and anoint this moment. Would you pray? Lord, we thank you, God, for your grace and for your mercy. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this moment, Lord, that we get to dive into your word and that we get to receive it. Lord, would you open our hearts? Would you open our ears, God, and allow us to take in this word? to transform our lives, to make us better Christians, better disciples, better moms, better dads, better people in the community. Lord, bless us. Be with us. We hear you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Anthony. You may be seated today. Whew. Well, today I want to take a few minutes and I want to talk to you about Do It Again. Now, I just want to clarify something. I want to say that for God to do something miraculous today or tomorrow doesn't mean that he's had to do the same thing previously. Nothing limits God. He didn't have to have done something like heal your body to, in the past to heal your body now. With God, all things are possible. So I just want to clarify that because some might be, the enemy might be jumping into your mind and saying, well, wait a minute, you can't believe for that miracle now because it didn't happen in the past. Listen, God can do anything at any time. Nothing can stop God when God wants to move. Amen? Second thing I want to do today is I want to share with you that these principles that I'm taking from the story of David and Goliath is not a exact formula that if you do this and you do that, that then God has to do this. We don't ever force God into a box and make him do what we want him to do. God can do, he's sovereign. He has a, a sovereign plan. However, that being said, in this story, what we find is that David partnered and worked in, in, in a situation where he was partnering and working with God in God moving in the miraculous way that God did. And so we want to talk about how you and I can partner with God so that he can move miraculously just what he did before, he can do again. Or if, even if he didn't do it before, he can do something that he's never done before because he's a big and a mighty God. And so we learned these three principles. We're going to learn the third today, but the first principle was this. If we want to partner with God for him to move. And how many know that in our world we need God to move? How many know that in the past we've seen 
um, God moved through revivals like Azusa Street and, and the Jesus Movement and Amy Simple McPherson. And we have others that have happened in other parts of the country like New York and other places. How many know that if he moved in the past, God can move again? We need God to move in our world. And so we learn that the first way we partner with God is we have to remember who God is. That was last week. And I encourage you to listen to the message. Because we need to understand who God is. What a big God that he is. That's what David did. He talked about how great and mighty God was. The second thing we learned is that we have to repeat what God has done. Remember, we, we learned how that David talked and testified. The Bible says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And that you and I need to testify to the goodness of God. In fact, I gave a, some homework that you were to go home at lunch and tell stories of the faithfulness and the goodness and the miraculous nature of God in your lives. So, remember who God is. Repeat what God has done. And here's what we're going to learn this week. This is the big idea, the bumper sticker. Write this down. We need to release the old for the new. Now, I used an R word for all three points just to help you so that you could know them later on. Remember, repeat, and what? Release the old for the new. I want to read some passages now. I want all of our locations. Blythe, I want you, if you're joining us in our church family in Florida or San Jose, I want you now to... To let me read this, don't zone out, because there's going to be some truths that we discover in this passage. This is the story of David and Goliath. Let's jump in. David is talking to King Saul, because he came to King Saul and said, hey, I'll fight Goliath. And Saul says, why should I let you fight Goliath? Why should I put the nation in the hands of a 16-year-old boy? He said, well, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And then he goes on to say, if you go on to that next part, guys, pull up that next passage. What happens is, is Saul goes, okay, God's with you. And so because he's with you, you go ahead and fight Goliath. But here's what you need to do. Put on my armor. I've got the best armor in Israel, the best sword. The best helmet, the best shield, so you put it on. So David does. Tries it on, and here's what he says. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in a shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath then... now. We're going to pause for a second because in between what just happened, and you'll see, Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering at contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. They start trash-talking each other, which is common in a battle, right? And as they're kind of talking to each other, and, and you know, Goliath's saying, I'm going to kill you and destroy you, and David's saying, no, you're not, because I serve the Most High God, and he starts repeating the testimonies of who God is. And then the Bible says, as Goliath moved closer to attack David, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. Then the stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. I want to give you two observations about release the old for the new. We remember who God is, we repeat what he has done, and we release the old for the new. But here's the principles that we need to understand what David did, because David, re- he, he embraced the new and let go of the old. I want to give you the first thought on this. You ready? Write this down, and it's simply this. A new enemy may require a new strategy. Can I say that again? A new enemy may require a new strategy. Let's get practical. Maybe you have a new problem that you need to solve. Maybe it's financially. Maybe it's relationally, right? Maybe it's something on the business that, you know, and then the job that you've got to find a solution. And the problem is, is that we tend to take the old way to try to fix the new problem. And what's interesting is that David realized that when you have a different energy, er, energy, energy, sorry, I just had some coffee or I had some chai, a little caffeine. When, when you have a different enemy, 
you probably need a different strategy. Here's what he figured out. The club that worked with the lion and the bear probably wouldn't work with a giant. We learned last week that he used his staff or a club to kill the lion and the bear. And we even know that he took the staff, the club, out to the battlefield with him when he fighted Goliath, but he never intended to use the, the club. Instead, he used the sling. Now, I won't get into it. If you missed last week, you've got to go back and listen on YouTube because I talked to you about the staff and why he took the staff, I believe. Because on the staff were markings that were, basically these markings were probably a bear and a lion that represented past victories of his history and the faithfulness of God. So the club, the staff, literally was a visual representation of a testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the, lone, by the, blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So go back and listen. So he has the club, but he knows that the club won't defeat a giant. Why? Because the giant has a, a sword. And I mean, no, a club is going to do no good when you're swinging a, a piece of wood, a stick, against a sword. You're going to lose in that battle. Because a new enemy requires a new strategy. So what does he do? Instead, he brings something different out into the battle. He brings a sling. A sling, I happen to have one here with me, and this one is probably very similar to what David used. You see, in the battles that took place in the time of David, there were different types of warriors. Goliath was what we call a swordsman. He fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's what he was good at. That's what he trained for. He was massive. He was a, a giant, and he had never been defeated. Because he was big, he was strong. His reach, his span, he could reach the enemy farther than a smaller man. Most men at those time, in those days, were very small, probably 5'5", five, 5'4". Five, five, he was close to 7 feet tall, so imagine the, the span that he had. You know, if you watch boxing, they talk about how that the person who has the longer arms has the advantage. So Goliath now was a swordsman, but there was also another type of warrior, and they were called slingers. And slingers were the ones who either used a bow and arrow, and they shot from a distance, or like David, they had a sling, and what they would do is they would bring a stone. And we saw that David grabbed five smooth stones. Now, I don't have a smooth stone. We did get smooth stones, but how many know that when you buy something on Amazon, it always looks way bigger So therefore, I didn't bring out our little smooth stones that came from Amazon. But he had a stone. Actually, let me show you what the size of many stones were. They're actually about the size of a golf ball. A massive. They would smooth them many times. Now, he went to the stream because by a stream, it would smooth the stones. So David now is using what's called a sling. Here's what's interesting about the sling is that the sling was used kind of like this. You had a part that was strapped or tied to your wrist, and then you had the other piece that you would hold with two fingers, and then you would do like this. You would whip it up, get it going fast, and then you would release it, and it would throw the stone. There were different techniques. You could do it, uh, some people that did it, did it more along this way, and they would go like this and sling it. And then they would put it on their head, and it would look really crazy and weird. What's interesting is that the physics behind this weapon is amazing. By swinging it the way that they do, it actually creates so much speed that it releases that stone at over 100 miles an hour. And the power of it is similar to like a 22 pistol. When it hits its target, if you notice, it literally sunk into the forehead like a bullet goes into the body that's the power of a sling. Here's what's amazing about the sling is that expert slingers were known to be able to hit their targets from somewhere between 200 up to 450 meters away. In fact, in doing my research, I discovered that the Roman Empire had expert slingers who were so good that they were known not only to be able to, from 200 meters away, hit their target, by the way, the size of a face, that's what it used when I did the research. 
They could hit the target the size of a face, but they could actually tell you where on the face on the target they were going to hit. And here we have a story of David, hundreds of yards away, sending, slinging a stone and hitting the giant right between the forehead where the brain is, where the greatest damage would be done. Now, some of you are saying, Pastor, you took a lot of time explaining that. That's kind of cool. But what does that have to do with the, the new versus the old? Here's the interesting thing. You see, David realized that when you have a new enemy, you might need a new strategy. Because here's the interesting thing. If he had decided to use a sword, remember he put on the armor? And by the way, what's interesting is David, later on in his career, what did he use? He fought with a sword. But in this situation, he was fighting a man who was known to be good with the sword. And here's what we also know, according to historians, that it's likely that Goliath, because of his physical condition, the reason he was a giant is he had some kind of physical disease that made him grow. And people who had that disease ended up many times being blurried vision. They had double vision and they were nearsighted. So here's the reality. If he had fought the enemy the old way, he would have had to take the club and get close to Goliath, therefore putting himself in hand-to-hand combat. In other words, by fighting the enemy the old way, he would have been at a disadvantage against his enemy. But by fighting in the new strategy and the new way that God was calling him to fight, here's what he did. did. He took the advantage away from the enemy. Now, why am I spending so much time talking about this? Well, because as I look at this story, how many people are still fighting their enemy that they're facing today the way you fought him three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, and you wonder why you're losing in the battle. I want to show you what the scripture says, because Isaiah says, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Israel with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned, and they were snuffed out like a smoldering wick. This is speaking about the Red Sea. And God's speaking prophetically through Isaiah to the children of Israel that he's going to do something new. He said, I, I, I delivered them through the Red Sea, but forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? Here's the interesting part. Basically, God says, when I do something new, the way that it happens is you have to Let go of the old so that you can receive the new. And here's the crazy thing is he says that in the context of talking about one of the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. And as I was meditating on that, I'm like, God, why would you bring up the greatest miracle, the Red Sea? I mean, movies have been made about it. Why would you talk about letting go of the old when you're talking about Something like the parting of the Red Sea. And here's why I believe God brought that up. You see, he's not saying that the past is unimportant or what he did in the past isn't powerful and amazing. But what he is saying is he's encouraging us to not confine him to what he's already done. How many times do we place God in a box? Can I stop and say, Jack is in the box. God's never intended to be in the box. You can't push him in the box. You can't keep him in the box. But what we do is we miss the new thing God wants to do and the new victories he wants to bring because all we can do is see what he did before because we can't open our minds to what he might want to do today. Can I give you a great quote you've heard a million times? Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And yet, how many people do the same thing when it comes to the challenges of life? We keep doing the same thing. Come on, have you ever seen the person at the gym that has been there for like the last 10 years? 
And they're walking on the same treadmill, drinking the same high-calorie drink in between, haven't lost any weight, don't look any more healthy. Come on, anybody been that person? Come on, amen. The, the weight hasn't dropped, the health hasn't changed, and yet they're still doing the same workout routine. When do you get to a point where you're like, i got to try something new? Because insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Why am I talking about this? Because this passage is, listen, God wants to do it again. He wants to bring a change. He wants to bring a healing. He wants to bring a breakthrough. He wants your marriage to be better. He wants that wayward child to come home. He wants you to get that promotion. He wants to bless you. The challenge is, is that we keep doing and fighting our Goliaths with a stick the old way rather than saying, God, I'm going to open my heart and my mind to the new thing you've called me to do because, God, you're a God of the new thing which means I have to let go of the old. So let's get practical. I want to grow. Pastor Jared, spiritually, I want to grow this year. But yet, maybe you've fallen into the pattern of doing what you've always done. Well, I'm going to go to church twice a month because, you know, that's the national average, and i got to hit the national average. So I'm going to show up twice a month. I'll get half of Pastor Siri. And every once in a while, I'll even listen to one of the ones I miss. And I'm going to do that. And that's what I've done for the last 10 years. And I'm still where I was spiritually for the last 10 years because I'm doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Maybe I do need to join a circle this year. Maybe you need to show up at that event they had Tuesday where they had the food trucks and get some free food and find a group where I can be connected and have people praying for me. Maybe doing something different will bring a different result. Letting go of the old and embracing the new. Well, I, might, I want my kids to have Christian friends. I want them to make good decisions. Maybe I should take them to youth group on Tuesday night where they can meet other Christian people, where they have a pastor, their age bracket, that can pray for them and encourage them. Instead of just letting them hang out with whoever they want to, whenever they want to, and never making them go to church, and never taking them to youth group. And I'm wondering why they don't have any Christian friends. And I'm wondering why I'm still struggling with them this year like I was last year. Maybe it's because we're insane. Because we keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Good preaching, Pastor Jared. Amen. I'm with you on that one, actually. Some of you like those examples because they didn't hit close to home. So let me see if I can find one that hits close to home. Um, Man, I've been struggling with this addiction. I mean, I wouldn't call it an addiction. It's just a weakness. I've had it forever. My, my, My parents had it. My grandparents had it. Wait a minute, there's, there's a Celebrate Freedom at Higher Vision where I can go and have people pray with me and hold me accountable. And how many times are we fight? Here's the question. Are you still using a club when God may have called you to use a sling and a stone? Come on, y'all with me, say amen. Because if we're going to see God do it again, A new strategy is required for a new enemy. And some of us are facing things we've never faced before. But I'm here to tell you, God has a solution. God is a miraculous God. There is a stone. There is a sling. There is a way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is a way through that trial. There is a way past that struggle. God can do what he says he can do. He can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. But are we going to keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result? Or are we going to release the old so that we can grab a hold of the new? Amen? Man, I feel the anointing of God in the room right now. 
come on, Santa Paula, I mean, Blythe, Blythe, do you feel the anointing there? Brazil, Texas, Florida, do you feel it? Some of you have things stirring in your heart right now. Some of you haven't got past, I'm that guy in the gym. I'm that guy in the gym. I'm going to do something different. Good for you. God, give us new things. Just say, God, we're going to step out and follow the new things you've called us to. So, remember who God is. Remember what he's done. And what's the last thing? Release the old for the new. And what we've learned is that a new enemy may require a new strategy. Here's the second point. This is the last point, and that's this. A new strategy may require practice. A new strategy may require practice. Let's go back to the, the story about him putting on the armor. Look what it says. It says, so, so Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot walk in these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. I think it's interesting that David even put them on in the first place. Why did he even try them on? I think the reason he tried it on is because he realized the old was not going to work. And he wasn't sure what the new plan was. So maybe this is the plan. But he put it on, and when he put it on, he had a realization. And the realization is that I can't use these because I've not mastered them. I can't fight with these because I haven't practiced them. You know the word tested? So, so then he took his staff and, and, and he said, I, I can't wear these because I've tested them. So what does he do? He takes the stone, he takes the, the slingshot, and he takes the staff. The word tested, he said, I can't wear these because I haven't tested them, is a Greek word, and here's what it means. It means to put something to the test. It means to ascertain its qualities. It means to discover its nature, its imperfections. You see, what happened in the story is, I believe, that David began to realize, listen, I need a new strategy, so I'm going to take the strategy that I've practiced. Because I'm going to tell you, David, listen, first of all, David, we know that he took care of the sheep right? Who's a shepherd? And that was important too, because how many know that what we do now affects, affects the next? And a lot of times we want the next, but we can't get to the next until we're faithful with the now. So he was going to have to be a king one day, and guess what the Bible says he did when he was king? He shepherded Israel with the integrity of his heart. So that was why it was so important for him to be a shepherd. He was testing, he was practicing his leadership. And the reality is, is when he was out there, come on, how many know being out in the middle of, of a wilderness with a few sheep could get awful boring? I mean, they didn't have cell towers and smartphones. It wasn't like he could go on social media and check out the other shepherds and how they were doing and how their sheep were and all the latest techniques in shepherding. And all the funny things that happened with the sheep that he could then send to his friends and say, did you see this? He didn't have any of that. So what would he do? One of the things we know that he did is he played the liar. That doesn't mean he didn't tell the truth. It was an instrument, okay? It was like a hand harp, a hand guitar. So, I mean, even then, he got really good at that, and he wrote songs. But how many know, even after that, for, after a while, you're going to get tired. You can only play liar hero so many times. You know, guitar hero, liar hero, sorry, just you know, harp hero. He got tired of it. So at some point, what does he do? He's like, you know what? I bet you, where's my sling? I bet you I could hit that rock over there. And so the next thing you know, he's like, I'm going to try because he's bored, right? I mean, you know, sometimes being a shepherd isn't fun. It's bad. Anyway, okay. <laughs> not, not very fun. So what would he do? He'd go, I bet I could hit that rock. The next thing you know, he's, oh, I missed it. You know what, if I release a little quicker, if I do two more swings, I can get more velocity. It'll go a little farther. And over and over and over again. The next thing you know, bam, he's hit the rock. 
And not only that, he's like, you know what, I like defeating bears and lions, but it's a little dangerous. So, you know, I figured out maybe I'll use my sling, and when the wolves get a little bit close, I'll just take my sling and, like, send some rocks their way and, you know, shoot it off the side of them, and, and then they'll take off running and won't come close to the sheep. You see, what he did is he spent a lot of time developing and practicing his new strategy or skill of attacking the enemy that was coming against him. And the point that's, that I find that we miss so much is that we forget a really powerful truth that seems so simple. And here's what it is. Practice makes perfect. How about I say it in a biblical way? Be not weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap if you don't give up. See, we undervalue the importance of practicing our faith, of walking through the trials. What do the scriptures say? You can read in the Bible, and the Bible says things like, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says things like, listen, count it all joy when you experience trials and troubles. Why? Because it is the practicing or the testing of your faith that produces perseverance. You see, part of the message this weekend is God saying to you and I, listen, there are new things that are coming, and when they come, God is going to need to use new strategies for you to take them down, for you to get through them, for you to get victory, for God to do it again. But the thing is, the devil's going to tell you to quit doing what you're doing now. He's going to tell you to quit taking the steps you're taking now. Oh, I don't need to serve. I, I got so much going on in my life. No, keep on serving. Keep on showing up. Keep on giving your tithes. Keep on praying. Keep on calling out to God. Keep on going to your circle. Keep on doing things. Why? Because in the process of practicing your faithfulness, you prepare for your Goliath. See, God isn't just a mean God up in heaven who wants to take your money and take your time and take your fun. Because you know when you become a Christian, you can't have any fun. No, what God is doing is, number one, he wants to give you a full life. He wants you to have a higher vision. And he wants you to defeat every Goliath that comes your way. So he gives you tools. So that as you are faithful with those tools. A a big one is, is giving. When you come and you bring that whole tithe, that 10%, and you give it, to your local, you're giving it to the Lord because you realize you don't give to the church, you give through the church. Because what you're doing is you're giving to the Lord. And so you bring that 10% and you give it to God through your local church. What are you doing when you do that? Some of you are worried that I'm going to actually, I put a rock in here. (laughs) Several years ago, I did a sermon about bows and arrows and everybody was freaked out in the whole auditorium. And I shot an arrow, but I shot it to the back corner. And people were still freaked out. Every time you take that step of faith, every time, you're getting better. I I can not only hit the, the target, I can hit the exact part of the target. I'm positioning myself. I'm working out my faith. I'm working out my faith with fear and trembling. I'm following the process. I'm doing good. Why? Because there will be enemies that come your way that on your own, in your own strength, in your own ability, you'll never be able to defeat them. But aren't you glad to know that if God is for us, who can be against us? So I want to encourage you today. God can do it again. But he's looking for people who will remember who he is will repeat what he has done and will let go of the old, will release the old for the new. I want to end with this. I want the worship team and and everyone to come. Guys, I'm not going to read the scripture for sake of time, but Jesus tells a story about, um, it's not really a story, it's more of a historical event. But what happens is, is that he he invites a man by the name of Levi 
or Matthew to follow him. Matthew was a tax collector. He was considered the worst of the worst of sinners, like a pedophile today. That's how bad they were hated. And Jesus says, leave it all and follow me. The next day after he leaves it all and follows Jesus, he has a party at his house and invites all of his tax collector friends. So that, And I love this because he wants them to experience the Jesus that he experienced. And when they show up at his house, all of the religious people start looking at him and saying, what are you doing? Jesus hanging out with evil people like that? How could you do that? And then Jesus says, and then they say, you know, you, you, I can't believe that you would do that. And then the, they even say this. They say, and your disciples, you know, John's disciples, they fast and pray. Your disciples don't fast like they do. And Jesus says this. First, he goes, listen, you guys need to relax. Because here's the thing. The well don't need a doctor. Only the sick do. And then he says this. He says, we all know that you don't put new wine into old wine skins. Because it will destroy the wine and the skin. It will burst. And then he says this. He goes, you put new wine in a new wine skin. And he said, and even when you do that, people, when they drink it, they always say, ah, the old is better. Why am I bringing this up? Because it kind of sums up this whole sermon. There is always going to be a tendency for us to say, ah, the old way. I like the old way. I'm comfortable with the old way. The old way worked before. The enemy will always try to get you to live in the past in the old thing, in the old way. And you know what's interesting? Is if you try to do something new, the old way, it destroys everything. And Jesus then says, you got to put it in the new wine skin. Because here's the thing. Did you know that wine represents in the Bible the Holy Spirit? Did you realize that God wants to release his Holy Spirit and do something new, something beautiful in your life? But if you keep trying to force the new thing into the old pattern, well, my old church, you know, they... They didn't have all those crazy lights going all over the place. And what do we do? We go to the old. We go to the old. I like the old better. That's what he said. Jesus said, we all, they always say the old is better. Is your comfort, is your path robbing you of God releasing is available for you. New wine is available for me. But we have to release the old. Therefore, whoever is in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And all things have been made 